Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Media Evolution and welcome everybody following us online. I'm glad to have you have you here. Some of you were here two weeks ago or maybe watched the recording that is, by the way, available when Nick Dunn came over from Lancaster University and talked about envisioning the futures of the built environment. And Nick, he talked about the way we've envisioned um, the built environment futures um, in the past, how we do that in the present and what we can learn from this going into the future. And one thing that he called for were visions for this kind of boring things, the systems and the structures and ways our value chains work and how, what type of communication networks and value systems we have. Another thing, um, he acknowledged something that we've seen over and over again, is that when we create visions or we create shape the future of the built environment, that we're never really starting from scratch or very seldomly do so. That we're very much building on the visions of past, of the past, of that are very much in the very concrete, um, the buildings that we are in, the roads that we're in, the telecommunications network that our, th our digital systems are built on and so on and so on. And some of these old systems, they may no longer serve the purpose that they have or unfortunately very often they have very detrimental impacts that cannot be justified when we move into, into the future. We are very much, as Daniel Christian Wall puts it, in a situation where we need to redesign the plane we're on in, in mid-flight, you know, really change the core of the systems while we're in them as well. And that's no easy task. That's why this evening we've asked um, Dev Chakra to return to Malmö after one and a half years since she spoke at the, at the conference to come and talk about this issue and very much tune in and provide us with some keys into to rebuilding, redesigning the plane we're in, in mid-flight um, by turning our focus on energy and on matter and on the ethics of care. My name is Reta Hafner. I lead our foresight work here at Media Evolution, a non-profit community-based and, and um, community-owned organization based here in Malmö in southern Sweden. Um, and I also have the honor to to lead a project together with my colleague Frida here tonight um, called The Futures We Built that is bringing us together here this evening. This is a strategic project by a strategic innovation program called Smart Built Environment that seeks to answer this question here. How will the built environment and the sector shaping it look like, function and be organized in a future Sweden where shared sustainability goals have been achieved? We do not have an answer um, to this. Instead, we've invited four interdisciplinary teams that are working throughout this, this fall to create visions that, that will then made available for, for each and every one of us. Um, and these visions are there to, to support the built environment sector to transform together very much. And this is Something to the, this evening's lecture is both a inspiration and knowledge to the teams, but also to the wider community here here today, and also following online on on how can we start transforming our built environment towards sustainable and inclusive futures. The agenda of the program um, of this evening looks like the following: We're in the intro. Soon we'll hear from Deb um, for about 45 minutes, 50 minutes. Um, after which we'll open up for Q&A and, and then invite you all in this room to continue the conversation outside over, over maybe another, another beer. Good to know for those of you physical, physically present, there are toilets um, in the main space, um, fire exit 
is there's one over here and then outside over here. And we are recording this conversation, so you will have access to the recording if you want to share it um, afterwards or go back into, into some of the things that we learned here. I also want to bring up that one way of continuing hearing and reading about debt, you can find a copy, and this is also available on the Media Evolution website of our most latest book from the Collaborative Foresight Cycle and Futures of Infrastructure, where Deb has written a beautiful and insightful chapter as well. And with this, I have the honor and the privilege to welcome our speaker this evening. Um, she is Professor of Engineering at Olin College in Massachusetts. She's also author of this wonderful book that I can highly recommend called How Infrastructure Works Inside the Systems That Shape Our World. And when not visiting us in Malmö, as you are for the second time, um, Deb writes, thinks, builds and speaks widely on themes of technology and society. She's very much an educator with strong technical background in engineering physics and material science with a focus on biological systems. And prior to joining the faculty of Olin College, she was a postdoctoral associate at MIT. Please welcome Deb Chakra. Thank you so much, Rata. Um, thanks for that great introduction. And now I wish I was here for, or at least um, had the opportunity to watch Nick Dunn's talk. Um, it sounds great and, and deeply relevant. Um, one, and certainly we will, I will be thinking, we'll be thinking through some of the same ideas, this idea that um, where the infrastructure that we have came from before we start thinking about what the future might be. And in fact, I realized that one way to think about this talk and the book chapter um, in the mesh we're in is that this is kind of a prequel. That's kind of like the, okay, now that we've thought about this, this is how to move forward. And this is a little bit more of the sort of big picture where stuff came from. So, um, Let's see, where do I want to start? So this is me. This is in 2016, I think, um, uh, with some friends walking the length of the LA River, which is 51 miles, so about 80 kilometers um, from its start to its finish. Um, and uh, so when I say that I'm interested in infrastructure, when I'm thinking about the built environment, um, I, people are often kind of like, what kind of infrastructure? And I realize that I'm, my focus is like, you can tell I'm an engineering professor um, because my focus is very much on, it's not you know, sort of on infrastructure broadly, if you think about it as like health or education or the legal system or for the financial system, it, I really do focus on um, the physical system, right? the technological systems of infrastructure. Um, so what we often think of as utilities. So, and I, I like this photo because you can see a whole bunch of them in it. So you can't see the cell phone in my pocket, but you can see the sort of water um, management, you can see the bridges, you can see the electricity. So those are the systems that I really focus on. So um, so that's really the focus of what I do. Oops, if I go to the other direction. Um, I love this quote by Ursula K. Le Guin about what technology is, that it's how a society copes with physical reality, that it's how people get and keep and cook food, how they clothe themselves and what their power sources are, what they build with and what they build and so on. And she says that technology is the active human interface with the material world. And part of the reason why I really love this quote, particularly the longer quote, is that it's not about how we do this as individuals. It really is how we do it as a society. Um, and the second thing I really love about this is that, actually there's many, I just realized that every word in that sentence I feel carries meaning for me, but I'm gonna focus on that the sort of technology isn't just the sort of high tech, what's the next thing coming down the pike, right? It's the really basic things. And a lot of what I'm gonna talk about in the context of infrastructure is, is a century or more old. So um, speaking of which, so this one is not quite that old. This is um, uh, the, you know, the main things I focus on include things like water. This is actually Lake Bullman, which is where Melmer gets its water from. Um, but the water tunnel, my understanding is it was built in the 60s and 70s to bring water, um, to bring water here. Um, so I care about water systems, I care about sewage. This is my sewage treatment plant, which is also built around the same time. Um, you can, I took this photo, I took this photo, um, cause you can see it from the, from leaving the airport um, in Boston. Um, this is, um, so I'm interested in transportation, particularly rail. Um, the newest thing that we recognize, kind of recognizably infrastructure, which is the internet and the telecommunications that really came up in the last 
couple of decades. This is a map of the undersea cables. Um, and I already mentioned electricity. Um, so I want to actually stop and go back and say a little bit about what all these things have in common in terms of how they work. So this is the reservoir um, north of New York City. This is actually the first one that was built. It's, it's, it's actually it's called the New Croton Dam because it was built on top of the first Croton Dam. Um, but that site is the first reservoir that was built for New York City. And the way you can sort of imagine if you're living in New York City in the 19th century, um, if you have a whole bunch of people who live in close proximity, everyone needs water every day. Everyone needs clean water every day, which is a little harder to get when you're living in close proximity to a lot of other humans. Um, so it becomes a little bit more acute where you're going to get your water from. And, um, but water flows downhill. Um, water can be easily divided and subdivided, right? That's how you go from like rivers to creeks to rivulets that, that can deliver water. Um, and so what this means is that if you can get together with the people around you, you can build out a system that is a reservoir and an aqueduct that delivers water to your city and that subdivides it and divides it to where it needs to go in the city. And there's a few kind of important things that fall out of this, right? One is, and this is why you could do it in the 19th century, once you build a system, you don't need any additional energy to keep it fu functioning. In fact, to this day, more like 97% or something of New York City water is delivered by gravity alone, right? It's just you build a reservoir and, you, and the aqueduct and you do it right and you maintain it, but you don't have to put energy in to keep it running. So it does mean you need to get together to make that massive initial investment, right? So you cooperate with the people around you to build this thing that everyone will then benefit from for, you know, I'm sure they were definitely thinking decades in the future, but it's now been about a century and a half and, and sort of carrying on that these systems were built. Um, the second thing is you clearly s would benefit from like we have clean water in our household, but the other thing is because of waterborne diseases, which we don't really think about very much anymore, but of course we're endemic, um, we're all over in the 19th century, um, if the people around you were getting sick because they didn't have clean water, your family would also get sick. So it is that very much in your, like even if you can, you know, you can pay to build the system for your family, you would benefit not only because you have clean water, but you benefit because the people around you have clean water. So um, this is kind of, so one of the reasons why I sort of talk about this in a little bit more detail is because the physical characteristics of water, that you can build it as a network that it flows downhill, and then the sort of, the physical characteristics of our bodies, we need water every day and we get sick if people around us get sick, means that that sort of sets the stage for a really strong incentive to cooperate with your neighbors to do this thing, to make this investment into the future as a group. And there's a reason why, of course, water, I mean, so I think of the two earliest types of infrastructure are, are roads and water, but water, as long as there's been sort of human groups, people have figured out how to manage water together because the sort of social piece of it falls out so convincingly from the physical characteristics um, of the system. And um, so that's why, like broadly, as soon as people get together, they're like, yeah, we should do this thing, right? It'll work out and make sense from a social point of view, an energy point of view, and it's why we absolutely consider water to be a public good in both the economic sense that you want, you don't want to sort of keep people from getting it, you, you want everyone to have access to it, um, but also in the moral sense, right? That is a thing that benefits the public. <laughs> and so water is one of the oldest versions of this, and but this type of logic broadly holds for a lot of things that we recognize as, as infrastructures, as networked infrastructures. So it's true of transportation, that it benefits that when more people have access to a transportation network because you're interacting with each other and you have commerce. Um, we I know of this um, Metcalf's law is how Metcalf talks about um, ethernet, right? And like, so this is like, you know, now a full century and change later, right? That if you have access to a network, the more people who have access to it, the number of connections between them grows much faster than the number of people attached. So if, there's, if you have like, for those of you who remember fax machines, but if you have like a phone line and there's two people who are on that phone line, and then you have, there's, there's one connection. If you have three people, there's now three connections and it goes up with very rapidly as you have more and more people connected. And of course, we are living in that world today, right? We're living in this world of connection. So um, the idea is that these physical networks um, end up being built out and they have sort of characteristics that come from being networks. And as I said, water is kind of the canonical example. So um, Amartya Sen is a, development, uh, um, a developmental economist and he wrote 
um, that we have an excellent reason for wanting more income for wealth, he says. It's not because income or wealth are desirable for their own sake, but because they are typically admirable general purpose means for having more freedom to live the kinds of lives that we have reason to value. Right, the, thing it lets, the things it lets us do. And, and this is, you know, I said I'm an engineering professor and I think about matter and energy. So he's an economist, so he frames it as money. But, I'm, but I think about what we do with it. And one of the important things that we do is we use it to buy energy so that we can do things in the world. And the single most important example is the one that is in evidence in this room today, which is that as soon as people get money resources that go beyond basic survival needs, the thing they do with it is get artificial light, right? And artificial light is not a survival need, right? Um, but this, you know, this, this actually, this correlation is so reliable that you, that you can use it as a proxy for the development of a region, right, by taking aerial photographs and seeing, you know, how it gets brighter over time as a proxy for economic development. And of course, the converse is also true, right? If, it, if an area gets dimmer over time. Because the, the idea that like what we want to, you know, the idea, I might just send frames it as freedoms, right, in the world to, do, to live the kind of life that we want to have and just the ability, and I really appreciate it in a place that's as far north as Malmer, to, um, to be able to turn on the lights and start doing what you want to do, right, as opposed to um, being constrained by the, um, our lack of ability to see in the dark or to see in inside spaces. So um, I think it really illustrates this idea that for most of us, and in particular because we are like physical beings in a, in a material world, right, per Ursa K. Le Guin, um, the thing that we do with money is we use it to buy ourselves the ability to do things in the world, which means broadly buying energy, and artificial light is just the most important example of that. So, so I grew up, I live in Boston, but I actually grew up in Toronto. Um, and so my hometown is kind of up here um, in Toronto. And um, I often say that my, my, my infrastructural birthright of being born in Toronto is that I actually grew up halfway between Niagara Falls um, and there's actually a nuclear power plant like right here, which is the other place where I grew up. And in fact, actually, um, I should just for a sense of scale, this is about um, 200 kilometers. So it's about like twice the width of Sweden at this point. Is it Kivik that's on the far, the other side of the peninsula? Right, yeah. So. Um, um, so that's, you know, just to give you, this is, this is like two-thirds of Lake Ontario. Um, and of course, because, you know, my favorite joke about being European or American is that in, um, in America, we think 100 years is a long time, and in Europe, people think 100 miles is a long way. Um, because, of course, I think this is really close. <laughs> um, and, uh, but what it meant was, so my parents immigrated from India, so I grew up in Canada. And so what it meant was that I grew up with access to this, the energy that was provided by a reliable electricity grid, um, access to transportation, access to clean water and sewage, all of these ways in which my society collectively invested in um, these networks that basically supported my life. So not just clean water, not just the one that you could kind of get with no energy, but the ones that you build out when you actually have access to much larger amounts of energy. And that was provided by, in this case, as in Sweden, predominantly hydroelectricity and nuclear power, um, which is still the sort of the bulk of the energy mix in Ontario as it is here. So, um, and so I think of that as kind of my infrastructural birthright. This is actually, there's, um, this is actually the hydro plants at Niagara Falls. Um, this is our standing, this is the one in New York State. Um, that's the Niagara River. Um, so on the right hand side is, is the New York Power Authority in upstate New York and on the left hand side is the Canadian one. Um, so I grew up on the, the left hand side. But both of these are downstream of Niagara Falls. So they actually take power from Niagara Falls. And it's this, you know, this incredible example of, in this case, one of the reasons why I like this as an example because it's not just the society on either side of the border that is cooperating, it's actually that both, um, both or both New York and Ontario cooperate across the border for kind of the most fun reason, which is that they have an agreement that um, no matter how much water they take to produce energy, that there has to be a curtain, at least a curtain of water falling over Niagara Falls at all times because tourists come to see Niagara Falls. You are not allowed to turn off Niagara Falls. So, so there is like a very serious agreement between um, the, the Ontario and the New York power authorities, right? So getting at this idea of 
this is how we kind of cooperate together. This is how we invest our wealth together to produce energy that gives people agency to do what they want to do and the level of cooperation that's involved. So one way of thinking about the story of the last, um, I'm going to say 100 years, I'm going to count from about like 1950 or so, is that these systems, which, which, you know, which started building them with the Industrial Revolution, so we started building them in the 19th century, is that these networks really went global. I mean, they basically grew in size and scale and extent, right? They got bigger, um, physically bigger, and they got their, um, they had more geographic extent, um, and they served more people. And so that's certainly true of things like electricity, um, that oops, keeps going in the wrong direction. Um, this is actually um, the building of the Hoover Dam in, uh, the 1930s in the US, but this idea of, of building it out, these sort of gigantic systems, um, and that everything is just kind of bigger. Um, we saw this for things like transportation. Um, so this is um, looking at civil aviation, um, which is the, the second thing that's really changed since really, again, after World War II, so the 1960s and 1970s, sort of the growth of civil aviation into something that is now global, right? That sort of every place in the world is now reachable. Um, and then the other really important one is the rise of containerization. And, you know, even just walking around Malmo, I can sort of see, right, the, the, um, the change in a city that happens when the cost, so containers, shipping containers essentially um, get rid of the friction between moving things in the ocean, across the ocean, and then moving things by land, right? So instead of having to, like, unload, having un to unload a boat and having a whole bunch of people and putting it in warehouses and eventually put in, putting that into vehicles. You know, we've all sort of seen shipping um, cranes lifting containers up, right, and then moving them into, um, straight into trucks or straight onto trains. So there's very, there's essentially so little friction that it meant that the cost of shipping fell through the floor to the point where it's essentially a negligible amount of the cost of objects, which is why 150 years ago, most of what you use would have been made close to where you live, and now that's not true anymore, right? Even over the course of my lifetime, that, that's really radically changed, right? The idea of everything coming from someplace else is a relatively new thing. Um, these are actually the three newest um, shipping container, um, shipping cranes in Boston, which does not have, I mean, it was a big warehouse town when it was built, um, but it's not really a major port anymore. It just has a handful um, of containers because the containerization also led to centralization. So all of these things, right, all of these global networks for how we talk to each other and how we move around and how we get goods and how we, um, we get our, our water and all these things means that the, sort of the true thing that we do together, the true thing that really differentiates places is not even so much like rich countries and poor countries, right? It really has to do with our collective wealth and how we spend it. So this is, um, this is not a map of GDP per cap capita. This is actually a map of, of energy footprint um, per capita. And you can see which places stand out. So um, I often say, um, so you can very clearly see sort of the global south and the developing north. Um, you can see that Canada has a slightly darker, oh, I realized my, my legend got cut off, but the, it's what you would expect, that the darker um, uh, places, the more energy it uses per capita. Um, so there's, um, you can see Canada's a little bit darker than the U.S., and I often say it's because Canada's both bigger and colder than the U.S., and it has a very similar standard of living, but it means you're going to use more energy. Um, and you can see Sweden up here, which is kind of in the same sort of ballpark. Um, and the, the, but the differentiation is not that we use this energy as individuals, it's that largely we use this energy through these collective systems. So... Um, the energy then, so our energy footprint is not about our individual wealth, it's the fact that our, our individual agency, the things we do in the world, is underpinned by these collective systems and we use our collective wealth to invest in these systems to provide us with that agency. So it's actually one of the reasons why it's really hard to make individual decisions to reduce your carbon footprint, right? Because by and large, most of our energy consumption is run, is channeled through these collective systems. It's also why when you like, I you know I flew into Copenhagen and I took the train across and I looked at the wind farms and I arrived here in Malmo, and um, the thing that you really notice in different places 
is it's less of the differentiation is we really we really notice the infrastructural systems. And even when we're thinking about like, oh, it, like uh, my family's from India, so I spent time there as a kid. And you know, India feels really different from Canada, right? And the thing that you think you're noticing is wealth, but in fact, one of the things you're really noticing is that difference in collective infrastructure, in collective infrastructural provision. And certainly, like as a nine-year-old living in India, the thing that was really germane was we only had clean water coming out of the taps for an hour a day, or we only ha we had we could expect brownouts in the afternoon. So, um, the you know this th this is a way a way of kind of framing how we think about. Um, our lives, we're, I think we're really kind of conditioned to think about it in terms of money, but the, you know, money, you know, I, yeah, when it's, it's thinking about it as it's, money is how we measure it, right? But like energy is the actual currency of the material world. Right? Energy is the thing we need to move through the world um, and to communicate, to, um, to get things, to get goods, to manufacture goods. So, um, the other piece, and this is a piece that I think we're all sort of familiar with, even if you haven't seen it this way, is this kind of framing that energy has to come from somewhere. And historically, you know, since, I mean, basically, roughly all of huma humans, basically all of the energy we had came from basically burning biological things, aka traditional biomass, until about 1850, when um, actually the first new come in, the first um, a uh, coal engine in the UK, the thing that's often considered to be the first um, commercial coal engine was in the UK. And the idea was that you took a small amount of coal out of the mine and you use it to power the water pump that the engine that powered the water pump that actually enabled you to take water out of the mine just meant you could get more coal out, right? So you take a small amount of coal and it means you get a larger amount of coal out. And it is like literally kind of the definition of exponential growth, right? And you can sort of think of that as the pattern that we've sort of followed is that we've taken the energy that we've had, and I remember I said everything's gotten bigger, right? We grew at the scale of things. It's because we took the energy that we had and we used it to build things that gave us more energy, like hydroelectricity dams, like nuclear power plants, and of course, like building out massive amounts of fossil fuel infrastructure, right? So using, using this energy to get more energy is, has been the pattern, and that has led to this sort of exponential growth in the amount of energy that we have and that we use. And you can see, you know, it was originally coal and oil, and then gas came online, and then the newer things, right? Nuclear hydropower, et cetera. Um, I realized that I went looking for this um, because I have 2019 data, and this, as you might imagine, figuring out the world's entire energy consumption is takes a little bit of time. Um, but I think the next bit of data is out. So it's, it's actually fascinating to see the sort of top part here you know, starting to sort of visibly grow on this. But it is still, of course, most of our energy comes from setting things on fire still. And, and that's the world that we're looking to change. Um, the other thing I want to say, though, is um, for those of you who pay attention, in the UK, they actually just shut down their last coal-fired electricity plant a few weeks ago. So it's a really kind of bookending, right, this first part of, um, of this growth, right, of coal that sort of kicked this whole thing off. and in the UK, and then the last one just, just shut down. Really is sort of a harbinger of the world that we're trying to build. So, as I said, um, you know, most of this still comes from fossil fuels, most of our energy is still derived that way, um, and we, kind of, we really know the consequences of this. So, I'm not sure this is, are folks familiar with this particular graphic, some of you? So, it's called the climate stripes visualization. So, each stripe is a year. And the intensity of the color, is it, the, is it um, cooler than the historical average? Or is it warmer than the historical average? And I probably do not need to tell you which way the axis runs, right? So um, this is going to the present, right? And seeing more and more years that are warmer than the historical average. And so we're sort of living in the consequences of the, that of the graph I just showed you about burning fossil fuels to put CO2 in the atmosphere. So that's, and then the other thing though about this, so one is, you know, we think a lot about decarbonizing our infrastructural systems from the point of view of not accelerating climate change, right? Of not contributing to climate change. But the other thing that is worth pointing out that I said all of these networks, these are all networks that bring resources to um, where we use them. And so one of the consequences of the growth of these networks is that it means that we bring things from farther and farther away. And I talked about that in the context of goods, but it's also true for, for things like telecommunications, it's true for things like energy, right? Electricity, um, 
bringing them from farther and farther away. And, and even if it's from relatively close, right? Like they are, all of these systems are embedded in the landscape because we are in the landscape, right? Our bodies exist somewhere on the planet. These are all sort of physical systems that are about us and the people around us. And the nature of these networks being passing through the landscapes is that they're sort of built assuming that these landscapes are pretty stable, which they have been, but that is no longer true. And so even if you did an excellent job of building out your, your, your infrastructural system, you designed it really well, if the landscape that you build it in is changing, then it's not gonna be fit for purpose anymore. And one of the examples I use of this is um, the city of Austin in Texas has an extremely well-built water supply. They're like really serious about, Austin in particular is really serious about public utilities. Um, but they had rains that flooded um, the hills and it kind of washed so much silt into the reservoir that it overwhelmed their, their, um, their water treatment system. So it's like they built it out perfectly well, you know, the engineers did the job, it's just that the thing that was perfectly fine 50 years ago, which they thought would be fine for 50 years to come, is no longer acceptable. And that's, I mean, you know, I mean, that's kind of a tame version of the story of things like California wildfires. Um, in terms, and we're sort of seeing the impact of, actually, I'm gonna go back and I wanna say one thing. We're, se we're seeing this impact of climate change and infrastructure every day. We don't always call it that, right? But the, um, every time, you know, literally every time you look at the sort of homepage of a newspaper and you see, um, I mean, fundamentally, like a natural disaster, right? The way we sort of define a natural disaster is its impact on infrastructure, right? So there's a certain, you know, there's a certain number, there's a, a certain thing that happens kind of in the moment, but broadly what we think about is, as a disaster is that infrastructural systems go down and the severity is how hard they go down and for how long, right? Like you lost power for a week, the roads were impassable, right? You didn't, you know, you didn't have, um, you know, fuel deliveries or food deliveries. So the na what basically constitutes a natural disaster is often mediated through, it's often almost defined by the effect that it has on infrastructural networks. The flip side of that, of course, is that you can turn that around. You can basically say if you can build infrastructural systems that are resilient to these kinds of shocks, then that will deeply mitigate the impact of natural disasters. So this is kind of, this is all of this, I feel like this is kind of like getting us to the present, right? So thinking about infrastructure as collective systems, thinking about them as ways we work together, thinking about them as things that have been built out over the last 150 or so years, um, and actually, you know, further to sort of Nick Dunn's point, that they were built out in a way that, I mean, really kind of embodies the values of the people who built them, right? They were built to do things like, we think that everyone should have clean water, we're gonna build this together. And we are now in the world where they're built, assuming that we can use, build them on fossil fuels, they're built um, assuming that the landscape is stable, which is no longer true. They're built, and this is especially true in places like the US, they're built with um, social norms or social benefits that embody values that are not the ones um, uh, that we want today. Um, and so we find ourselves in this present where we're like, okay, this is where we are. And you know, one way of saying it is like, we built out all this stuff and it kind of works, but we also know it really sucks. <laughs> and we're not sure it's gonna work into the future. Um, so I'm now, now that we've sort of got us to that point in the present, I'm actually gonna step back and um, offer us the million mile view. Um, and this is literally the million mile view of Earth. This is actually an image of Earth that's taken from Lagrange point one, which is the sort of stable point between the Earth and the sun. There's an observatory there that faces the Earth, so it could actually watch the Earth all the time. Um, so in this image, you can just see it in the middle. Um, the sun is kind of behind you and you're looking at the at the earth, and I think of it as kind of the modern blue marble, it's kind of about this wonderful image. But there's kind of two things I wanna highlight from this image. So the first one is that the earth is positively drenched in solar radiation, right? That it is getting every moment, every instant, um, it's getting solar energy from the sun um, that powers kind of every biological and, and um, all meteorological processes pretty much on our planet. And the amount of energy that arrives that way is actually stunning. Um, it's, if, you know, if all, if everyone on Earth used energy at the same per capita footprint as Canada or Sweden, it's still only a fraction of a percent of the incident solar energy, right? So we're kind of used to thinking of renewable energy as like scarce. 
And it's like, no, no, the actual energy is abundant kind of beyond belief. What's, what we haven't been able to do is we haven't actually been able to figure out how to access it, but it's all there. The second thing that, that you notice from this image um, is that the Earth, the Earth is surrounded by the void of space. So, um, so like, you know, barring the odd meteorite or the odd spacecraft, nothing really comes in or out, right? It's really sort of a closed system. And when people started burning carbon dioxide, they were like, whatever, the atmosphere is huge. We can just keep dumping CO2, right? We're not gonna run out of space, it's not a problem. Um, there's a now black humor, the solution to pollution is dilution. Um, thing like joke, or, I mean it wasn't a joke originally, that was like your strategy, right? As a, as a civil engineer in 1850, or I guess probably up until 1950. And, um, and we don't really buy that anymore because we're kind of running out of space to delete things. So, um, so everything that gets, everything that we use has to be mined from somewhere and then whatever it turned into has to go somewhere, right? And so that's essentially what's been happening with carbon dioxide, but it's also what happens with all of the sort of things that we use, all of the materials we use, all of the, all of the, um, all of the ores that are mined for use um, stuff, right? Just like it has to, there's nowhere else for it to go, right? It has to go somewhere, um, and where it just goes is somewhere else um, in the planet. And we are hitting the limits of this, right? This is what we talk about when we talk about like the problem with the environment, right? It's this issue of pollution. So, in the present, and the thing that has really changed in the last you know, 20 or so years is the lovely Danish windmill design. This is actually in Palm Springs, California. And um, so one pe people have been trying to actually build windmills actually at this site. Um, there is like what I definitely think of as a graveyard of windmill designs, um, because people have been trying to build uh, like windmills for electricity um, for a solid, like definitely since the beginning of the 19th century. And sorry, the beginning of the, the beginning of the 20th century, so like 100 years and change. And the reason why you see this one everywhere, right, why it's like, you know, off the, the, the bridge here and then 3,000 miles away, or actually 6,000 miles away, 10, almost 10,000 kilometers away in California, is because they cracked it, right? This is the design that works amazingly well. Um, do, you know, to concerted effort, not by accident. Um, and then similarly, the other thing that sort of happened in the last 20, 25 years is um, the development of economically feasible um, solar panels, right? And that too was due to a significant investment, um, a sort of the decision to be made to like be like, we, we want to get these out of the lab, we want to make good enough solar panels. Um, this is actually a solar farm in Hyderabad, near Hyderabad in India. Um, so this is sort of the change. And so what this means is that for the first time in human history, we have a pathway to meeting people's energy needs using only renewable energy. And for my purposes, the reason why that's relevant, I know you know this, the reason why that's relevant is because it means that we can actually go, we can get energy without having to pass through matter, right? To pass through matter sort of in like an incremental way, right? without transforming matter is maybe a better way of saying that. So instead of going from like you take fossil fuels and you burn them and the, the you get CO2, it's like you have a solar panel. Sunshine comes in, electricity goes out, nothing else changes. And um, so we basically can use that energy as energy. And there's a bunch of things that falls out of that. Um, I'm just gonna think, I'm gonna talk about this first. So the first, like it's, it's actually, it, I mean, it's genuinely kind of hard to wrap your brain around, and the thing, I, I want to live in a world where like everybody has all the energy that they need to do everything that they want to do that's available to them, and I know that world is now possible, right? It has never been possible before, it is now possible. The, prob the problem is the thing, the thing is the last time, the practice that we've had, the thing that we've done is we are not good at thinking about energy like this. What we're good at doing is we're good at building out systems where we think about um, some people are gonna be harmed and some people are gonna, be, are gonna benefit from it and, um, and then we build out sort of systems accordingly. So the thing that I'm kind of concerned about is that if we go into this world with the mindset that we had the first time we had access to a huge amount of energy through fossil fuels, we're gonna be digging ourselves a much, much deeper hole. And so one of the pieces of that mindset is this idea of you can make someone else deal with the costs, 
Um, and so I use this as an example. This is the same power plant I showed you earlier at Niagara Falls. This is the New York power plant. Um, this is actually a Google map of the area behind the power plant. So this is the power plant right here. This is the New York one. This is the, um, just across the river is the Canadian one behind this reservoir. This reservoir here was half of, half or more of this piece right here, which is, um, belongs to the indigenous peoples who live in that area. So this was the Tuscarora people had a treaty with the federal government in the United States to have this land, this patch of land in Niagara Falls. Um, and Robert Moses, who some of you um, may be familiar with, um, went to the US Supreme Court to ask for um, them, basically the US to break this treaty obligation to get this land to build this reservoir. And I'm sh like, I know that the logic of this was there are people who live in New York City and if we can give them a reliable electricity supply, there's a very small number of people who live here. So we are going to um, build the system where the, the benefits um, will outweigh the harms, right? Like the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Um, and he, not surprisingly, got it. Um, and it's a little bit, the one thing I kind of want to say that's a little bit um, like not kind of cut and dried is this idea it's not so much that this group of people benefits and this group of people is harmed. Everyone who lives in this region benefits from having access to clean, renewable, abundant, inexpensive electricity. But only one group of people who have access to it were harmed, right? Who had to like deal with the consequences of it happening. And that pattern we've sort of seen over and over again in the development of infrastructure over the 20th century, right? It's like you make decisions about who's gonna benefit from it and you make decisions about, well, someone's gonna be harmed um, or you don't even necessarily think of it as harms. Like I think about um, uh, like a lot of things were kind of built being like, oh, well, like we'll just put it there, especially in North America, like no one's using that land. Um, but this is of a piece with stories of sort of colonization. I mentioned my family was from India. Right, so India was was basically has railroads and you know uh, the Suez Canal and telegrams, right? Because it was all about uh, consolidating control by the UK in order to take resources from India to the UK um, or to Britain during the 19th century um, until 1947 or so. Um, it's interesting, actually, thinking. I think it's really interesting thinking about places like Scandinavia because. The other thing you can do is you can actually, instead of saying, well, this is a group that'll benefit and this group that'll be harmed, is that you can say, well, we are gonna mitigate the harms. We're gonna try to build these things in a way that no one is harmed. And the places where that happens is where, instead of having this sort of distribution of, well, there's a distribution of harms and a distribution of benefits and they're not evenly distributed, right? Some people get the benefits, but they also get the harms. In places like Scandinavia that have like a long historic tradition of sort of equality and that sort of everyone is there together, those patterns don't hold as strongly because it's like, okay, well, there is no other group that we can, you know, it's not physically big enough necessarily to put it elsewhere. It's not, there's no other group, right? It's like, we're, it's for all of us and therefore we need to figure out how to sort of mitigate the harms. And um, I actually I think of it, there's an example, there's a power plant in Wales in the UK that's a really beautiful example of this, of like recognizing that the people you're building it for who live on um, in Great Britain and the people who are benefiting from it are, or would be harmed are the same people. And they went to extraordinary lengths to limit the sort of damage to the environment so that it's basically hidden, it's next to a natural park, you wouldn't know what was there, right? Whereas I live in the world where you build giant like dams somewhere where you think, well, no one's gonna go there. It's like huge, it has this impact um, because of this mindset of, well, there's the people who benefit and then there's these other people. And there's much less of that sort of world in Scandinavia um, and in Sweden. And I think it actually gets you, you're in a very different position to think about this idea of using energy to mitigate harms instead of displacing them. Um, so, so that's the first thing, right? So think about the fact that when we built these infrastructural systems, we sort of had it for the benefit of a group and potentially with other people being damaged. And to be fair, you know, the canonical example of that is in fact fossil fuels, right? It's like you, the whoever burned them in whatever, like in their vehicles or whatever is the person who benefits from them, but 
the CO2 molecules, of course, affect lots of different people in lots of different ways, right? It's diffused through the atmosphere, and different places deal with that in different consequences. So even if you're like, okay, well, locally we do a good job of mitigating harms, we're all still living in this world that's built, been built on fossil fuels. And what that means is that we're all still diffusing those harms elsewhere in the world. Might not be as direct as we're displacing these people, right? But it is definitely as direct as if you live in a place like Bangladesh, which has a per capita energy footprint that's a tenth of what it is um, here or in Canada or North America, um, you've never benefited from access to these fossil fuels and you are almost certainly going to be dealing with the consequences in terms of like your climate, in terms of you know, increased intensity of, um, of typhoons and the like, right? So we're all, this is sort of a common thing. It's just the, the actually it illustrates another really good point. The way it manifests in different places is really different, right? But the sort of patterns are still, in, still holding. So the other thing, that um, I want to talk about is the other thing we did when we got access to huge amounts of energy is we used it to do things that just take a lot of a large amount of energy to do. This is an aluminum smelter. So um, no matter how you slice it, for basically chemical reasons, it takes a huge amount of electricity to get aluminum out of its ore. Um, aluminum isn't rare, but it's why we didn't use it until the 20th century, really, because it just took so much energy to separate out um, and turn into aluminum metal. And so when we got access to these sort of large amounts of energy, aluminum went from being literally a precious metal to being pretty much literally disposable. And um, to be fair, aluminum is actually recycled fairly well. It depends a lot on where you live, but because it takes so much energy to get aluminum away from its ore, that it's almost always economically viable to recycle aluminum because you know, money is how we measure it, right? But energy is what actually matters. And so if you say something is economically viable, often what you mean is it's energetically feasible. And it's like, it's, it makes sense energy-wise to recycle energy. But the last time, so I'm looking at saying, well, we have all this abundant renewable energy. The last time we had all this abundant energy, what we did was we sort of supercharged the idea that we can extract stuff and turn to something else and then dump it, right? And it's like, that is the thing that we cannot do again. Um, but what, what we can do, and of course, the, you know, the worst scenario of this is aluminum gets recycled, but plastic does not, right? And if you, I know that um, Malmo gets, um, has an incinerator for waste, right? And so if you can burn it and get heat out of it, it means that it take, you can get energy out of it. And that means that if you want to do anything else, if you want to reconstitute it, you need to put energy into it. So one of the reasons why plastic doesn't get recycled is because it, of necessity, of physical necessity, requires energy, which means until recently, you'd get that from fossil fuels. It seems really dumb to like be like, okay, I'm gonna use fossil fuels to make plastic, and I'm gonna burn more fossil fuels to make this plastic into something else, right? You can sort of understand the twisted but real economic logic of, we're just gonna use fossil fuels to make more plastic. But of course, we're again, we're sort of hitting the limits of that. But so one of the things about renewable energy, of course, is that it, it actually opens up new possibilities. So just like access to large amounts of energy in the form of things like hydro made aluminum extraction possible and in fact commonplace, um, we're starting to see the possibility of what we can do with renewable energy. So I, I use this as an example because Itasha, this lovely person here, um, now Dr. Itasha Cave did her PhD in Stanford looking at a catalyst to turn carbon dioxide molecules in the air back, mix them with, 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 with water. Um, it takes an enormous amount of energy to do this, but to turn them into long chains like plastics, like biofuels. But the key, the catch is that now using renewable energy to, energy to do that. So in order to do this, you need, you need two things. You need to know how to do it. That's where the catalyst comes in. And you need to have huge amounts of energy that is relatively inexpensive, and that's where renewable energy comes in. So um, she was actually in the very first material science course I taught as a professor, um, <laughs> and she's now the CSO of this company that is actually doing this. So there are many companies like this. This is an illustration, right, is that people are starting to figure out that if we have access to energy that's renewable that doesn't involve going through fossil fuels, it really can change what we do with matter. Right, so it's like all of this time, we've basically been like, we live in a world where like, energy is really scarce, so you have to burn things to get it, but matter, like whatever, you just pick it up somewhere, you dump it somewhere else, no problem. Um, and we are now in the world where we can actually sort of engage with the actual planetary reality, 
which is the opposite of that, right? Energy is abundant and matter is scarce. And so people are sort of starting to put this together because um, that's sort of the possibility for the world that we can live in. So um, I mentioned I really love this windmill and Vaclav Smil, who's a famous energy scholar, sort of famously said words to the effect of the, the you know, windmills are basically made of fossil fuels, right? And it's what I said at the beginning about we use this energy to build things to give us more energy. So um, is it Lil, Lil, what's the name of the wind farm? I want to say Lil Dum. <laughs> oh no, I'm the only person. So this wind farm was built in, I think, 2011. And so like, I pretty much guarantee you that like all of these windmills were built using energy from fossil fuels, right? That were built using sort of extracted materials. And the way I kind of think of it is like, I want like the first windmill to have been made entirely from fossil fuels and entirely from extracted materials. But like someday, hopefully someday soon, we'll have a windmill that's entirely made with renewable energy, that's entirely made from repurposed materials that was made possible with renewable energy. Right? So like the first one is all made of fossil fuels, but like one day there will be one that is not made from fossil fuels at all, right? That we've sort of gone through this transition. And that's the thing that we're sort of looking at as the possibility for our future. So this is our built, this is my built environment today. I know there's probably parts around here that looks like this. Um, you know, we didn't, we didn't get here overnight, right? Like we built out these systems with these kind of mindsets of, um, like how we use matter and how we use energy and like what's cheap and what's not and which humans matter and which humans don't matter and like how do we want to do this and it took a lot of took a lot of time and energy and work to get here right so this is not a thing um, that happened overnight this phys these physical infrastructures embody the values of the people who built them which are not our values right and we are now in a position where we have to but also in a position where we can like choose to transform these systems in a way that means that they will be sustainable, that they will be resilient, that they will be functional, that they will be equitable. They kind of have to be all of those things, really. And um, because if we want to build systems that are gonna last, they need to be decarbonized, they need to be resilient to climate change. Um, they are of their nature gonna be able to address some of these problems. But what we really kind of want is to have the kind of mindset shift to say like, okay, if we live in a world where we have abundant energy and a world where we have finite materials, which we do, right? That's the planetary reality. How do we kind of apply one to the other, right? How do we think about the future where we use renewable energy to close materials loops and how does that change what we do today? And a huge piece of that is this mindset shift, right? Just thinking about how we use things. So I'm actually gonna wrap things up there. This is Ursula Franklin, who was a material scientist. She was an alma, at my alma mater of Toronto. And she said that central to any new order that can shape and direct technology and human destiny will be a renewed emphasis on the concept of justice. And I think that what we are talking about is exactly this, right? Is a, a new um, order to shape and direct technology. Um, so what we need to think about is how do we do it in ways that are just. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Deb, for uh -huh. your lecture. Um, we have now time for some questions. Um, so please get your questions ready and raise your hand. And I'm going to start off with asking the first one. And I just wanted to comment on on what you said. I think it was really interesting to what you said about how there's only one group being harmed and who, who benefits. And I think that's a really relevant topic also for Sweden, where mm. we have a lot of... Um, um, disputes and, and difficult issues up north that we don't necessarily always think about when it comes to our wind farms and, right. and renewable energies um, and, and the Sami people in, okay. in Sweden. So yes. that's, a, that's a really good point for, for us to, okay. also to think, think in terms of, uh, of um, what happens um, in this country. Um, but my question was um, around our roles and skills and competencies. You're also teaching a class here today. Um, tomorrow morning um, about about the similar things and so on. And we also have one of the teams um, in the, the features we build who are creating a vision around like what are the future roles and skills and competencies um, that are needed in the built environment sector as we transform into into renewable energy, um, more sustainable practices and, and so on. Um, so I would love to hear you're you're also an educator, so you've you're you're basically teaching uh, <laughs> skills of, of um 
of the future. So right. what's your take on what? Well, I mean, you know, on? the first thing I want to say is I think it's actually it's really clear how much of the specifics of this is now really situated in place, right? And you can sort of see it in me sort of thinking and talking about um, the sort of Swedish context versus where I'm from and thinking about the Sami people here um, and the, the sort of question. So one piece of it is, is, is kind of getting away from the idea of like, we can just parachute in and build a dam, it'll be great. And into the like, I do not know your local context. Mm -hmm. And so one piece of it for sure is, is actually having that deep situated knowledge of the places where you're building. And so I know one of the ways in which folks have sort of dealt with this is this idea of finding ways to interface with communities, mm. right? And so one of the roles is that sort of community, um, the, that sort of liaison, that sort of ability to sort of talk between groups is absolutely a key piece um, because of the situatedness of, of, these sort of, new, of these sort of new ways of thinking about infrastructure. Um, we, t I, I, we were talking earlier, I have friends um, at a design company called Spherical and they're actually building out um, systems that are, it's, it's actually, it's kind of weirdly like SimCity, if any of you have played that mm -hmm. game, except that it's for Los Angeles. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's basically the ability to sort of see what types of infrastructures are present there and it makes it really easy to be like, oh, if you make the, the, the concrete permeable, what does that change? Like, it's like, oh, this is my school. If the, the parking lot, because schools in LA have parking lots, if the parking lot was made of, impermeable con of permeable concrete instead of impermeable concrete, what would the benefit of that be? How much would it cost? So it's sort of a tool that is, I think it's going live this month and it's, it is intended to be actually um, freely available, but it's mm. LA focused, so, but the idea is to make it larger. And so getting these kind of tools that are necessary, th if you're gonna ask people to think about what makes sense for the community, right, have tools to think with about that and tools to communicate with. So those types of understandings, like share, developing the shared understanding mm -hmm. of what is in your locally situated environment seems like a place, because as soon as they were like, we're doing this thing, I was like, oh, I want that, <laughs> right? It's like, that's such a hard thing for people to wrap their brain around. So those are the two that sort of come to mind, and they're, they're in fact working with community facilitators. Yeah. Um, so those are the two things that immediately come to mind, and it's the real, how do you get that deep knowledge um, of the place you are, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to just being like, oh, well, we'll just treat you like any other place. Right, thank you so much. Well. All right, turning I'm gonna put my cup down over here. here. So Frida has over. a mic, so please just, uh, we have a question here in the in the front. So thank you. Um, my name is Johan Petura. Uh, I have a question. So um, when we talk about sustainability, we yeah. we usually kind of focus on the individual responsibility. Uh, but so from your talk, it's more about kind of solutions are more collective, uh, probably not individual. Do you have like a way to speak about the collective solutions without kind of taking away the individual responsibility? So I, I mean, I am definitely a um, like a, a maximalist, right? And and kind of in all things, um, not that there's no kind of one right way to do things. I don't. I think that it is both an individual responsibility and a collective responsibility. Um, and I think it's often really important to think about in a given context what is the thing that can be done by individuals, or what is the thing that should be done collectively. Um, and again, you know, I think this is extremely context specific in terms of who has the capacity to do what kinds of work um, or to do what kinds of things. So um, I don't think, I think that expecting someone else to solve the problem takes away from individual responsibility, but I think that there are many aspects of this that cannot be dealt with as individuals. And a big, I mean, you know, a good example of that is like, where does your electricity come from? And if you're like, okay, well, I'm just getting, this is a very USC in response, it's like, well, I'm gonna be individually responsible and put solar panels on my house. And it's like lots of people do not have that as an option. In fact, I live, I live in a mixed use building. I don't own my house, right? I cannot put solar panels on my roof as an individual. It's just not an option that's open to me. Um, my city basically essentially did a, did a thing where they said, if you would like all of your electricity to come from renewable sources, just tell us and we will tell your electricity provider and and then they will basically know that there's a whole bunch of people who live here who are willing to have, who want to pay 
the cost, like the very small increment to have renewable energy instead of whatever the mix they would provide. It basically provides a pull for the for the um, electricity provider to make a shift, right? So that's that's the kind of thing that I think about as like a balance between the individual, like I certainly know people with solar panels, and the like finding collective ways for for so that everyone has a pathway to be able to do this. Um, that includes what they can do as individuals, but also gives you a pathway to do things collectively because there are some things that you just can't do as an individual. And I think that balance is going to be really different depending on where you live, right? It's going to be really different depending on what's available to you. Um, it's going to be really different depending on sort of your socioeconomic status or your sort of um, your economic precarity. It's going to be really different depending on what's sort of in your environment. Um, so I don't think it's, a, I do not think it is an either or, they're an opposition thing. I think it's a finding ways that you can both um, make these changes as individuals and make these changes collectively in a way that makes the most sense for the context that you're in. Thank you. Question over here and then, then there. Hi, uh, Hi, thanks for the wonderful lecture. Thank you. I have the question about the at cross-border dam project. It's really fascinating that the two countries can yeah. agree on such a big project. And um, how? Uh, what is the context that they um, uh, they made agreement? Because I heard also in the recent years, um, like the interstate uh, uh, collaboration for electricity network construction in the US is very <laughs> difficult. I, mm. I read a book about <laughs> someone who tried to build one um, HVDC line across several states in the yeah. US. He spent nine years and failed. And a journalist heard about his story, even wrote a book for him. Right. Yeah. So I'm trying to think of what, do you, know, do you remember the name of the book? I, I will send to you uh, right after. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I have a strong suspicion that that's in my backyard. And um, because uh, people have been trying to build power lines from uh, Canada, from Hydro Quebec to Massachusetts for a while, and um, and it's it's faced all sorts of challenges. Um, yeah, I mean the, <laughs> I mean it really sort of illustrates. I mean I I always say that the thing, um, I think it, it is underappreciated outside of the country how much the U.S. is just fifty different countries in a trench coat. It's like, everyone thinks it's like, it's America. And it's like, no, it's really, it's like, it's actually more than 50, because there's like every state is its own, like has its own thing. And, um, but on top of that, like depending on where you live, your different parts of your state might have very different cultural things. Um, so it is hard. And the thing, you know, the reason why that they spent nine years of their life doing this was not because they were trying to solve the technological problem of how you build a grid, right? Because it was an entirely social. Right, it's entirely the way it's structured economically and politically and socially, and um, and that that really sort of illustrates the point beautifully, which is that a lot of what we're facing now is is you know the thing I said is like we have we kind of know it's possible to build these systems out. We kind of know what we have to do. We are we are very much in the world of figuring out how to do it together, and that's partly why it's the collective, not the individual problem, right? Because because some of these things can only be done collectively. Um, I do not think there's a one-size-fits-all answer to that. I think that one thing that is changing it is um, people sort of beginning to sort of wrap their brain around the utility of having um, basically living in, in, that, in the world where we have like larger scale energy I mean, the, the specifics of the problem can be variable, right? But like things like having like a grid, like having a larger grid, and the the reliability or the ability to use energy generated in other places is the kind of thing that's going to change that. It is, as you might imagine, incredibly frustrating, <laughs> right? To hear things, to hear about that. It's like we could just do this as long as like why can't people just get their act together? Mm -hmm. And the the way in which they're getting their act together is different in different places. Um, the other thing though, is that the, I spent nine years doing this thing across multiple states and I couldn't make it work, is, is makes for a good book, right? Um, the thing that is, so one of the things I talk a lot about is like this, the world that we're building, like these systems are much more locally situated, right? Like locally specific. It's not just these sort of big one size fits all solutions. And what that means is that when it happens, it's not very obvious to people outside that it's happening. And so um, there's a huge number of small scale, like locally specific projects that are happening that are having significant impacts in the communities that they live in that are like just not visible outside that 
community. And which is great in the sense of um, it makes sense for that community, one. Two, it's happening, right? And, but it does mean that it's really easy to feel like nothing is ever happening and nothing is ever changing. Mm. Um, instead of being like, no, no, it's actually happening everywhere. I just can't see it very well. And the nature of the problem is that it doesn't all have to happen all at once. If it happens in a thousand different places, right? It's, it's, that works just as well as like 1,000 sized thing, right? So, um, so it's, it's really easy to focus on the large scale stuff that isn't happening and it's really easy then to overlook the equally important small scale stuff that's happening everywhere. Um, and again, I think this is, I mean, I'm most familiar with the American and the Canadian context. And like, you know, in the US, I recently learned that there are, there's, there's a significant funding bill to support change. And so if you ask, I think if you ask people, they're like, yeah, I don't know what's happening with climate change, everything is terrible. And it's like, they funded 55,000 different projects mm. that are like s intended to be like climate change infrastructure projects mm. in across the US. And I was paying attention and that was still 10 times more than I thought. Mm. <laughs> and, mm. but like every one of them is like locally specific. So it's like, you don't really, it's hard to wrap your brain around them. So that's the other side is like, I would like the big stuff to work. Right, but I also am really happy to see all of the small local stuff getting happening. But I understand that's much harder for us to see, and I think that's true globally. All the things that are happening everywhere that are just hard to see mm. if you're not right there. Yeah, thank you, Dan. We had a question over over here first, and then there. Um, hey, uh, you kind of uh, answered part of my question already. <laughs> I'm super curious about this. Um, the state of things which is uh, more objective and not uh, not perceived by individuals we obviously have a very narrow perspective especially in time we yeah. are we are we are biased in the sense yeah. so i acknowledge this bias and i'm curious to hear from you do you see uh, any tendencies in terms of our governments and you know public institutions more or less interested in investing in infrastructure because when we look back we we see how the railways exploded 150 years ago. Yeah. We don't really see similar explosions right now, but it doesn't mean they are not happening. So do you see um, you know, big infrastructural projects accelerating or decelerating? It seems that some projects are very hard to build right now, but maybe it's just an impression. So um, I, there's actually a new book out by, I want to say Brett, Brett Fleberg on like building big projects. Because um, I mean, the, the question that we hear, I get all the time is like, it's like, why can't we just build another like subway or like another giant thing? And it was like, um, so there's sort of two two pieces to that, right? One is, I mean, the U.S. has, and actually this is a very situated thing, right? Like, I feel like every place has it, their own answers for why they can't do it, and they're all different. Um, it's the what is it? Is it Dostoevsky? Like, happy families are all alike, and unhappy families are all unhappy in different ways, <laughs> right? And um, what why it doesn't work is different in lots of different places. The so I think I agree that like in lots of places, it's it's the the idea of like we're just going to build this big thing is um, hard to wrap, hard to, to get people's brains wrapped around. And this that is like an active topic of conversation among everyone I know who cares about this, right? Which is like how can we do that? How can we do that better? But the flip side is the thing that I just described is these two federal in the U.S. These are two federal grants that have funded all of these small projects, and it's like. That is also the, f the government getting behind making this change. It's just doing it in a way that's not building a giant dam in the desert. It's like doing it in a way that makes sense for the communities. And so I think in that sense, like I think that, and you know, I was talking to someone who was like, you know, building renewable micro like energy um, systems in developing countries. She was working in India, right? Where it's like, you know, instead of like, we're not gonna build out a giant coal plant, it's like, we're gonna go straight into a community and build out like a local solar thing. And similar things are happening in places like Puerto Rico, right, building out community microgrids. So I don't think that there isn't, um, and again, this really depends on your government, right? I don't think that like government don't care about doing this stuff anymore. I think it's manifesting in different ways. But also, I agree with you. I think that there is this like really hard to build out the thing. And, and I, I've lived in the UK, so I tend to follow it and like watching things like the cancellation of the, the high speed rail line in the UK, it's just like, ugh, right? But, and then, you know, I live in, in the US, which is not a place that people really think about as being cutting edge infrastructure, and like, there was just a bunch of money that just went into mm. um, interurban rail, 
right? And like, I definitely know that you can now take the train from Chicago to the Twin Cities to Minneapolis, which you did not used to be able to do. Mm -hmm. And people are like, I can go to Chicago by train. It's so exciting, right? And and again, like, I don't, I just think that people. I mean, I doubt anyone in this room knew that there was like this major development because we don't notice the things that are small but important to the people mm -hmm. there when we're not there. So I think it's really hard to see. But I don't think there isn't a commitment on the part of a government. But also, like, if you live in a democracy, we are a government, right? Like, we, you know, we're, you, all of you showed up on a Monday night to listen to, like, a professor talk about energy and matter and infrastructure because you think it's important, right? And because you want to be able to, like, push the people who are making decisions around you to make decisions, um, and you want to learn more so you can do that, right? So I think that's a piece of it, too, mm -hmm. right? Is, is um, you know, the idea that, that, that you know, we, we don't, we don't follow our leaders, our leaders follow us, right? Like people make decisions about how, what values they want to have and what kinds of things they want to do and then they, they, they use that to push um, their leaders into going in that direction. And that's the, actually the other role of individual responsibility, right? Is that you make, you live according to your values and then that gets manifested in things like policy. Thank you. We take one more brief question, brief answer before we wrap up. Yeah, over there. Thanks, Deb. I'm Theodore. <laughs> transportation yeah. in built environments. Personal transportation in densely built urban environments. I'll build on your words that energy is abundant and matter is scarce. And I'll say, see if you agree with me, best infrastructure is no infrastructure. Here comes my question. <laughs> With minimal infrastructure, how do you see transportation of people in densely built yeah. city environments happening so it's just for everybody? So um, people are, there's, uh, I'm trying to think of who's the person I associate with this. People talk about building things like the five minute or the 10 minute or the 15 minute city. So the idea would be that you would live in a place and everything you need kind of on a daily or whatever basis is pretty close to you, like your school, where you work, your, you know, your grocery store, if you, uh, your church, all of those sort of immediate needs are within 10 or 15 minutes, so walking-ish distance. And, um, and so that is the world, right? Where it's like you need you don't need infrastructure, right? It's like it's like you're walking, you're biking, you're 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 getting around in that sort of fifteen minute city. And then I think of those as kind of nodes on a network, right? That are then connected to other parts of the city using things like public transit, right? But the idea is that in that dense in the dense place, you need sort of minimal infrastructure. I think of like Barcelona's super blocks, which sort of fall into that category. Um, of, of sort of taking everything out other than sort of pedestrianizing the sort of the large blocks. So that is certainly, I mean, there are different versions of it. Um, complete streets is a version that um, folks talk about. Um, in the US in particular, this idea of, of having um, cores, particularly places where you would normally drive someplace to be the idea that you, you drive to the sort of neighborhood and then you park your car and then you're just in foot um, in that neighborhood. So this, that, the no infrastructure is, is good infrastructure is manifesting in lots of different ways and lots of different ideas around urban planning. Mm. Thank you. I am going to change the slide and while I do that, I'm gonna take final question and yeah. you'll get to think about this for a little okay. while. And um, we are here in the context of the futures we built, which is about visions for desirable futures of our built environment. And so I would love to hear your desirable future. And you've talked about how it's very contextual and locally based. So maybe <laughs> maybe a place that's very dear to you um, <laughs> in, let's say, I know 30 years is very short when it comes to infrastructure, right. but if you get to dream and envision, what would you hope that the place where you'll be You'll be in um, where you are today, looking into 30 years. What would the infrastructure and the built environment be like? Yeah, you know, there's then? a truism that we overestimate what we can do in a year and we underestimate what happens in 10 years. And so 30 years is, you know, it's a short time in the context of like when were the roads built? And it's a longish time in terms of this kind of change. Um, so I actually, I live, well, I guess I have two answers. I have the sort of the hyper local answer and I have the sort of large scale answer, right? So the large scale answer, is 
that I really want to live in a world where um, everyone has access to energy that enables them to have freedom to live the way they want to live. And I mentioned my family's from India. Um, most women who are, look like me, like middle-aged brown women, do not get to do things like I get to do, right? Like I get to do this solely because of where I was born and the access to energy I had. But at the sort of hyper-local, so I live in Cambridge. I live, um, I live halfway between MIT and Harvard. I'm not a professor at either institution. Um, so I live in a really dense urban neighborhood and I still have a car because I drive out to the suburban college where I work. Um, a few days a week, and I get to reverse commute. I also have a bike. I literally live on a subway station. Um, I don't. I would like to live in the world where, like, I never have to drive my car, right? Like, where basically it's like there's good enough public transit to, for me to get out to the suburbs. Um, I would love it if the main street that I live on was fully pedestrianized, except for the odd, like, delivery vehicle um, and transport for people who are mobility impaired, right? So it's like there's a subway underground and then there's like transport service for people who can't necessarily walk or bike to where they're going. Um, I would love it if the building that I live on that I do not own, that my landlord owned, had solar panels on the roof. Um, Australia has such penetration of solar power, they just hit, um, for the first time, 50% of their power came from solar, from rooftop solar mostly. Right, so like I don't understand why like the, the extremely flat roof of my building isn't covered with solar panels, but I don't get to decide. Um, there's, um, so yeah, so it's like it's easy, it's, you know, I can definitely think about like in my neighborhood, right, like what are the things um, that I would see, that I could see potentially, that I could see potentially change. Mostly it's um, no cars, like I would love to live, love for there to be no cars. And like the, the s my street is lined, there's cars parked on both sides of the street, mm -hmm. right? Like I imagine having that back for cyclists and pedestrians, right? Imagine, <laughs> I have a car, I, l I like my car. Yeah, in dense urban neighborhoods, they don't scale is what's wrong with them. Mm. Sorry? So, um, you know, it's interesting, okay, so actually, you know, what? why don't we, why don't yeah. we wrap things up here Excellent. so that the nice people on the live stream and those of you who would like to go get a drink or ask me other questions can go, and then I, if you can hang around for a bit, we'll talk about cars and, and urban environments. Unless you, you have a few more things of your vision, so <laughs> don't. <laughs> but yeah, thank you so much, Deb. So um, we'll Thank you so much, um, and I will just close off here, and those of you in the room, please do stay for, for another beer and, and uh, have a chat with Deb as well, uh, so thank you so much. Thank you so much, thank you for having for this. me. I'm going to say a few words, you can, you can have a seat. Um, what's coming next, if you're interested in joining any of the other kind of educational seminars, conversations that we have, I have a few tips, one on AI um, and creativity coming up um, early November, um, not here, but at Kunstmuseum. Uh, um, you can sign up for the waiting list. There's also a, a, a live stream of that. And then 30th of January next year, we will have those four teams that will, um, will exhibit the visions that they have created and have an opening um, of that exhibition at Form and Design Center here in Malmö and also on live stream that you can follow, follow up. So meeting up for beers outside. Thank you all for watching and, and thank you so much for this evening and thank you Deb for coming to Malmö. Thank you.